Hi, my name is Greg Natale. I am the uh, production manager here at the Irish Classical Theatre Company. We are sitting in the Andrews Theatre um, where we put on all of our productions, uh, a theatre that's in the round, has audience on all sides. Uh, I'm going to explain what a production manager does, but I'm going to do that in a minute. First, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about who I am and how I got here. Uh, I grew up in Buffalo, actually I grew up in De Depew, um, and uh, went to college at the University of Buffalo for theater, and then uh, stayed around town for a couple of years, uh, working in little theaters here and there, and realized I needed more training. So uh, as soon as I could save up enough money, I moved to New York uh, so I could study more and hopefully get the big break. Um, a friend of mine, Jim Moore, who was a here, uh, here in town in Buffalo, moved to New York as well, and I went to see him in a play. Well, after I had moved down, I said, Jim, your, your acting has become completely different. What's going on? And he told me about a teacher that he had been studying with and a thing called Meisner Technique, which at that time I knew nothing about. Um, so he introduced me to his teacher, uh, Greg Zittel, who eventually became my teacher, where I studied Meisner uh, Technique for the next two years, which changed my life in terms of being an actor uh, and also a director because I've, I've become a director since then uh, and that that training has informed everything I do and how I look at life including in my regular life too and that's a whole other subject matter. Um, so in New York after my training I worked with a few theater companies uh, and one of the theater companies was called uh, Working Stages and in it, uh, once a year, we would do a one-act festival, and actors who were not yet directors got the opportunity to uh, direct a one-act, short, controllable, and overseen by the regular, more experienced directors. And when I did that, then again, another life-changing thing happened where I fell in love with directing. So for a while in New York, I did directing and acting concurrently, going back and forth, eventually getting my union card for the Screen Actors Guild as well as for Stage Actors Equity Association. Um, there wasn't a lot of work in New York at that time for film where I always felt like I really wanted to head to eventually. So I left New York to head out to Los Angeles and that again was a big gear shift. Um, quite a different experience living in New York City and Los Angeles. You can't get two more different tempos in major urban areas if you tried. So once I got used to it and got work as a carpenter, so I've always worked in the construction trades along the way to make my living as a struggling actor. Some actors go into waiting tables or bartending. I was always a carpenter. Um, so again, in Los Angeles, started to hit a little bit. Got new agents, things got a little better and a little better, and eventually I did a lot of work as an actor in television commercials. That's where I did most of my work. Occasionally on a TV show here or there, or a small film here or there. Um, and eventually I, I really fell in love with directing more and more and more, as well as technical theater. So that's kind of how I came to this job. So all of that, and I was a guy who had power tools and a pickup truck, which meant that you're always the guy who helps to build the sets and starts to do all the work and runs the lights from place to place. So little by little over the decades, I learned all of the various elements of technical theater. So a production manager. Uh, that job is basically uh, working with the set designer, lighting designer, costume designer, uh, props master, uh, hair and makeup, dialect coaches, and the director. So my job is to help the director win with all those other technical elements from theater. So we start pretty early on, a couple months out, maybe sometimes as much as three if it's a complicated show. We start having meetings with the director and I help facilitate all those people and help to keep the budgets going and online and on track for all the disparate elements that come together to make the theater, the technical living space of the theater come to life. The director takes care of the acting, and my job is to make sure all the other parts come in. I wear two other hats around here at Irish Classical as well. I'm also the uh, technical uh, director, which basically is a fancy title for, do you do anything that the other designers don't want to do or can't do, or we've just plain run out of time? That's what the tech director does. Just hammers, screws, paints, finishes, hangs, whatever has to happen. Uh, and my third hat around Irish Classical is as the uh, facilities manager. So I take care of the building. We have offices across the hall from our lobby. 
And I just make things work, and I work with custodial staff and make sure the building keeps functioning and call landlord whenever things go wrong. And that's another hat that I wear around here. The other one, as an associate director, um, has been one of the joys of my life because, you know, when you come back from one of the big cities, you feel like, oh, my career's over, or I didn't become everything that I thought I could be. So, you know, when I came back home from Los Angeles with my wife and my baby in arms and another one due within a couple of months when we got back in town, I, I really felt like, um, you know, I, I had failed uh, in, in my dream, the vision of my dream for myself. And between my family's theater company and then being asked to come here, that really gave me um, a reason to, to stay in the arts, which is really where my heart lies, has always lied. And um, I, I felt like this opportunity here, I got to direct and have continued to direct some of the greatest American plays, Irish plays, um, I've done musicals. So uh, I've been able to do things here that if I were still in Los Angeles, probably would have taken me another 15 or 20 years to get to that level in that, in that big of a town where there's tens of thousands of actors and directors. Um, so it's been a real blessing in that regard. This kind of uh, theater that's in the round, it's both exhilarating and terrifying at the same time for actors and directors in particular, uh, and sometimes for other uh, designers. Um, the problem is, is that there's always somebody sitting on this side, and the person who's behind you can't see your face when you're facing this way. So we're always trying to invent reasons for the actor to walk around the room. And the way I was trained as an actor, props are a really useful item to keep you busy and doing something that's useful and truthful in the moment on an acting level. So I have just always brought that forward as much as I could, whenever I could, into a play that I am directing. And in this play, we have a kitchen, we have the writers, the, 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 one of the main characters, the father is a wannabe writer and onion farmer. Um, and the wife is beating all of the furniture and the walls in the house as, just to keep herself sane. And there's a lot going on, and, and this is the kind of set and props play that I love because it gives the actors things to do one after another after another. And when they have something to do that's real, it just makes it more real for them as the actor and they just believe in the circumstances and the reality of the play. And especially one that is as bizarre and wacky as this gets at times, you really have to help the actors to believe in these bizarre circumstances. So it's the, the form follows function, right? Function one or the other follows the other, and it just works great in this kind of a play. And then we also sometimes use the fact that an actor is facing an audience, half of the audience, and they can let that half of the audience in on a little secret about some object they're dealing with or an emotion they're dealing with or a thought that they're having about whatever the character behind their back is saying. So a half or a third of the audience gets to see what that character is going through, and then when they turn around, they can turn around with a different point of view that they need to, to then go deal with the other character on the stage, but that half of the audience is in on a little secret. So that's another one of the things that's great about theater in the round. Um, we always want to keep people moving because you don't want them facing one way for very long. So again, we always want to say, okay, what's the reason that you could leave that moment? Is that character giving you something that makes you angry or you laugh and you can fall out of that moment with them so you can begin to cross the stage and go somewhere else that looks truthful and honest? even though sometimes they're completely contrived by us. And the actor, with their craft and their ability, backfills the moment and makes it look honest, and the audience just believes it out of their talent. Furniture, I, I, you know, it's got to be short because people sitting in the front row can't see over a tall piece of furniture. Uh, but we figure a way out. We cut the legs off. We've, we've, I've literally, Paul Bostaff, one of my set designers for a play, went in, tore open the back of a couch carefully, recut the back of the framing, the wood framing, and lowered the whole thing eight degree, eight, eight inches because we loved the feel, the look of the fabric and the sofa, and he lowered the whole thing so the audience can see over it and then reupholstered everything, and it looked fantastic. So that's some of the work that we do here. Our costume designers have to have things figured out that look good from the front and the back, and we do all kinds of costume changes literally in hallways as actors run around from the dressing room to one part and make an entrance because we have three doors that they come in and out of constantly. And sometimes they're running 
slipping into one costume, putting the shoe on, putting the second shoe on, and walking on stage. And the costume designers uh, and the wardrobe helpers and, and the quick change help for their costume changes are working on them as they travel. So it's, it's, it looks all perfect, even if they're coming in here from a romantic or a depressing scene. They may have been bedlam outside that door, but by the time the door opens, that actor has gotten themselves back in to wherever they need to be for the, for the feel of the scene. Um, so it's a very special theater in that regard, plus people are so close to us, it's as though they're in the room with us, which again is an exceptional feeling, uh, both, both for the actor in the moment and the director, who we really try to make sure that the, the actors are working in a way that, that really engages and brings the, the, uh, the audience right in the room since they're there anyway, and let, we, don't, we don't deny that and we actually play to it. Thanks. That's it for me. I'm going to sign off now. This wraps up our third episode of Behind the Scenes with Irish Classical Theatre Company. Next week, we're going to begin a three-part series about past, present, and future, which will involve Vincent O'Neill, then Fortunato Pesamenti, and ending with Kate Leconte Alcacer. So join us for those. And remember, come see us next Friday, 7.30, same Irish channel, same Irish time. Good night.